for them. So uh, we begin our second session today with a talk by Yuri Gurevich, but before uh, we announce uh, uh, the talk itself, I would like to uh, again uh, 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 to invite Georg Gottlob, uh, longtime colleague and friend of Yuri, to present the shortest introduction, uh, introductory words about uh, the speaker. So, Georg, please. Thank you very much. It's uh, really a great honor to introduce uh, Yuri and a pleasure also. Uh, Yuri is a world leading logis logician, mathematician, and computer scientist uh, who has made fantastic, tremendous transformational contributions in several areas of these three disciplines and who has solved many important problems. So uh, Yuri was born in uh, the former Soviet Union in the Ukraine, actually. Um, he studied math at the Ural State University in Yekaterinburg, uh, formerly Sverdlovsk, and uh, he got his master's degree in 62. So why do I mention a master's degree? Normally in such a, in, in introduction, you don't mention a master's degree, but I mention it because in his master's thesis, he already solved an important problem in group theory, okay? Then uh, he got his candidate degree, which would correspond to PhD in 64. Um, and again, his thesis solved an open problem of Tarski's and showed that uh, the first order theory of abelian groups is decidable. And he then got also a higher doctorate at the same university, which um, is a kind of habilitation, or, which gives, allows you to become a professor. And uh, in this time, he also did fundamental contributions on the decidability or undecidability of quantifier prefix classes, which uh, he is one of the main actors in this area. Uh, noticeably, he has shown that the class E A E A star, yeah, so E is existential, then. Uh, universal existential universal star that this fragment over a, a single binary predicate is uh, undecidable that decided this, this is, cannot be decided and uh, he also proved some meta theorems I cannot go into the detail but they, they show up in several of his works and this meta theorem in particular is uh, now called the Gurevich classifiability theorem about the strictness of quantifier prefixes okay in 1969 he became a professor and chair of the mathematical department at the National Economy Institute in Yekaterinburg or Sverdlovsk. In uh, 1973, he emigrated with his wife Zoe and two uh, twin daughters to Israel after some time in Tbilisi, uh, where he also had an academic position and did fantastic work. And in Israel, he taught at uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, um, where he collaborated in um, uh, also in Israel, he collaborated with uh, very much and very intensively with uh, Saharon Shelach. So most researchers uh, who collaborate with Shelach uh, come come to him, bring him a problem. Shelach then thinks a little bit, maybe overnight, sometimes even a couple of minutes, sometimes a couple of hours, and finds a clue, the clue to solve this problem. And then the researcher who came to Shelach goes back home and works for half a year to make a paper out of this, okay? Uh, this is in part, of course, also true for Yuri, but not only, because Yuri also, for Yuri, it worked the other way around also. So Shelach came to Yuri with some problems and Yuri solved them. So I think this is really remarkable. In, in, already at this time. And uh, while uh, in Israel, Yuri obtained many fantastic result, results and also started his famous collaboration with Leo Harrington, where they proved the uh, Gurevich, what is now known as the Gurevich Harrington theorem uh, about forgetful determinacy of certain infinite games. And this theorem, which has many, many applications in different areas, but one of the first applications and the, probably the one that they intended it for was uh, originally to improve uh, the uh, Rabin's proof to shorten and make it more easy, easier, uh, um, the Rabin's proof of decidability of S to S. Um, but it, this theory gave rise to a lot of other results too. 1982, uh, Yuri became professor uh, of computer science. So he is formally, he's nominated computer scientist in that year at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And he has done at that time after that, or, or even before that, wonderful contributions to both logic and computer science, and especially also to the combination thereof. For example, in finite model theory, 
uh, which has a very close relation to, to relational database theory and descriptive complexity theory, where you describe complexity classes uh, through um, logical formalisms yeah, and say this formalism can express exactly all problems in this class. Okay. And uh, contributions. Uh, so, so he made contributions also to the ongoing quest for a logic for uh, polynomial time. It's currently not known whether polynomial time can be captured by a logic and Yuri made very important advances in this direction. Uh, the problem is still unsolved, but everybody who works on it now has, uh, has to look at Yuri's work. Uh, what is also remarkable is uh, that Yuri produced fundamental results, not, not only in theory, but uh, so in theoretical computer science, let's say, but not only in track A of theoretical computer science. Track A would mean algorithms complexity, okay, but also in the so called track B that comes from the Journal of Theoretical Computer Science that has these two different tracks. Track B is semantics and programming languages. And very few people make contributions to both, and Yuri is one among them. Uh, so, to, just as an example, in track A, he did many deep decidability results, some of them already mentioned, but others for, for specific logics, etc. Worst case complexity bounds, new algorithms for concrete problems, but also fundamental results on average complexity. And contributions to track B, especially, I would like to mention his work on abstract state machines, uh, which is a fundamental model invented by Yuri for a model of computation. Uh, which is now used by many software engineers for specification, especially, but not only for specification, also for proving that certain things, certain program properties or system properties. And uh, in this context, also, uh, Yuri formulated the so-called ASM, abstract state machine, ASM thesis, uh, which is a form of Church's thesis that can be proved, actually, under very, very weak assumptions. So it's a kind of concretization of Church's thesis and a very weak assumption you can prove every computation uh, can be done in with ASMs basically with abstract states machines. In from 98 to 2018, so 20 years actually, uh, Yuri changed. Yeah, He went to Microsoft Research in Redmond and then the new chapter of his life began, a new phase, if, if we could give colors to it, maybe, I don't know, blue or whatever. Um, he continued to work on ASMs, but also on many, many other problems. And he solved many problems that engineers from, or researchers also from Microsoft Research, but also engineers from Microsoft gave him. And uh, many patents uh, arose from this area. Uh, I will mention three, I will just read the name, the, the title of three patents. So one is enterprise graph method for threat detection. So that's about security. Uh, here Yuri was not the main inventor, but he was, he solved an important problem. And so he's, he, he became an inventor. Then other, another title of a patent is method and system for decomposing single qubit quantum circuits into discrete, into a discrete basis. So this is about quantum circuits, quantum computation, and uh, Yuri has done fundamental uh, work on that too, and which has ended up even in a patent. And here Yuri is a main contributor. And then another, just for the fun of it, another title of a patent, lifestyle recommendation systems. Yeah, so Yuri has collaborated with two lifestyle recommendation systems. So eventually Yuri, I will ask for some recommendation about lifestyle. He has solved some problem in these big systems here yeah, that, um, um, obviously was, was so important, his contribution, that he's now a co-inventor of this. Now there's much more to say about Yuri's research, but I don't want to steal much more time from his talk. So I want to conclude on a personal note. I consider myself happily a disciple of Yuri and uh, because in our collaboration, I was never formal, formally a student of Yuri's, but in our collaboration, in several collaborations, I have learned a lot from him. And his friendship is really very, very valuable to me, uh, even though we haven't seen for a long, met for a long time. His openness and his approach to problem solving is unique and fantastic. And one thing that maybe only his collaborators know is that Yuri really loves working while walking. And so we have done math together uh, and logic together uh, uh, during many wonderful walks in Michigan, in Vienna, in Redmond, in Seattle, in Dachstuhl, in Oberwolfach and elsewhere. Wherever I met with Yuri, there were long, long walks and development of, of theorems during these walks. And I would actually go as far as to say walking 
is equivalent to working scientifically yeah, for Yuri, equivalent. So you can discuss about everything with Yuri over lunch and over coffee, but when you walk, uh, the topic switches to Mars or logic. So that's very in an interesting observation, I hope. And vice versa, when you work with Yuri, you start at a blackboard or nowadays at a whiteboard, but soon you find yourself walking with him because Yuri says, oh, oh, something is here, stop. Yeah, A problem starts to build up. Let's go for a walk and let's talk to about this at, uh, during the walk. And often it is solved, not always, but that's how life goes. So thank you very much, Yuri. Um, for accepting this talk, and I hand, it, hand the microphone over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you for this very nice introduction. I think it's a very uh, precise remarks uh, about Yuri. And, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I think what I will not add anything to what you said, but uh, I have a couple of my own favorite Yuri stories that I could tell, but not now. So uh, let me give the podium to Yuri. And the title of his talk is Logic and Foundations, Personal Perspective. And uh, I know that Yuri has uh, specific opinions about theoreticians, logicians. And so I expect actually something interesting uh, and uh, provocative in his talk. So please. Brace yourself. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, I'm humbled by all this. So let me put my slides. Do you see me? Do you hear us? See the slides? No, we see you. No. Oh. I see Lev. <laughs> but you did it before, so it must work. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Just one moment. Share screen. Yeah. Oh, screen sharing has stopped. Mm -hmm. Now we see it. Everything is fine. Okay, good. What you can also do is to show, full, uh, go to full screen mode, like Control L or something like this. But uh, as as it is now, it's also good. I, I think it's good. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. I'm very humbled by this introduction. And thank you for the invite. The topic of, of um, logic and foundations is close to my heart. It would be great to make a broad sweep of glorious past, examine the present, which seems to me a bit less glorious, and discuss the certain future. But even though the talk is not by the way stocks go, it's not very short, but nevertheless, the time is short. More importantly, my scholarship is limited. Hence, this restriction to a personal perspective and to replacing systemic exploration with a few illustrations. The goal is to spur a discussion on the role of foundations in logic. As Lev guessed, the talk may be may seem to you provocative, and you, if you do think so, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was intended to be so. Of course. Uh, epigraph one. When the roots are deep, there is no reason to fear the wind. That's in favor of foundations. There's another epigraph. 
there does not exist a category of science to which one can give the name applied science. There are sciences and the application of science bound together as a tree and the fruit it bears. Louis Pasteur. Here is a more blunt version of it. It's not enough to know your worth. You still need to be in demand. <laughs> so let me quickly say of my own roads to foundations. Uh, I came from a humble background. I, my sister and I were the first generation to go not only to school, to a college, but also to school, to regular school. And my first exposure to foundations happened actually in middle school. A teacher tried to prove, to prove that two triangles are congruent. She said, well, let's take a third triangle. And at this moment, I started to worry, where does she take this third triangle from? It was soon after the war, the Second World War or Great Patriotic War, as it's called in Russia. And there was deficit of everything. I was staying hours in bread lines and lines for anything else. And suddenly, why there should be such an obvious and ample supply of uh, triangles? The teacher was stumped and all the students suddenly were listening to her, which was <laughs> not, not exactly the case before that. And after a second, she told me, shut up. That was my first exposure. <laughs> but I kept thinking about it. And it's indeed, of course, a foundational question. Uh, then I went to local polytechnic, then eventually transferred to Euro State University in the city current, currently called Ekaterinburg. And my first seminar was in algebra. I also had to support myself uh, first going with friends of mine to do some physical jobs at the railway station, and other places, then by teaching, but eventually by, mostly by programming. And at the, when I was already finishing university, a bunch of us organized something today it would be kind of startup but of course in, in those times it didn't work that way we we worked with transportation ministry and uh, made some substantial changes in the way um, in the way uh, goods are distributed over the city. It was quite a difficult problem, in not linear. And I'm not sure even today there are clean, nice algorithms. But that gig job part of it made impression on me. Before that, anything, the more abstract was the better. And suddenly I had a, taste of doing something which actually people use. And it was sweet, a sweet feeling. On the other side, I was doing algebra. And as Georg mentioned, solved some central problem for our seminar. But I was much disappointed. I found general algebra sort of too easy to problem to pose problems of unquestionable precision, but questionable importance. So I had a bit of, 
when I was finishing and getting my master, I get a bit of a, a crisis. And then a friend of mine gave me a birthday present, which changed my life. It was a copy of uh, Kleene's Introduction to Mathematics. And I read it and studied it and knew it by heart and was much impressed. And what mostly impressed me, the, the foundational flavor of it. Of it. The next uh, encounter with foundation was uh, at Jerusalem Logic Seminar. Uh, I should make a, one little correction to, to what Georg said. Shella actually never came to me uh, asking me to solve, <laughs> solve problems, but I did solve his problems because they were published in, in a paper that was so I can, can tell the story. I came to I come to Jerusalem during the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And I, before that, I exchanged letters with uh, Michael Rabin. And I met him the very first evening we were in Israel. So what it was in his apartment. And Michael told me, whenever you want to talk mathematics, come to me. OK. I wait a day or two to be polite and went to talk to him, but he was a rector or in, in uh, European terms or um, oh, in American terms, uh, the, the main, the guy who, the main guy at the university. And there was a lot of people waiting for him. So I was wait, waiting a little bit and then I realized I will not be able to talk to him. And as Azriel Levy, whose name I knew, he was the dean and um, Chaim Geifman was in the army because the war was going on. And then I met this young guy and he asks me, my Hebrew was very poor, but I understood, but essentially he asks whether I have open problems. I said, yes. And I explained to him one when I came in in a week. He told tells me that he sold it. Uh, I didn't believe him, and I listened. And because of Hebrew, and because uh, he is not really the best explainer, but what I understood that all intuition that I had, he did. So he confirmed my conjecture, and. So so it was made a big impression on me. You know, the very first person I meet in the free world solves my problems. So what should I do? Maybe I should go quietly to high school and teach. So I asked him whether he has open problems. And he gave me that paper of his. He went, uh, eventually published in Annals of Mathematics. And it has a lot of uh, conjectures. And I worked on them quite a while, but eventually I proved some and disproved some others. Okay, so this was the correction. But the in the seminar, I was exposed to forcing, which I didn't know before, and that was definitely foundational. Logic seminar somehow moved me. My intention was to, to do something practical, but but for a decade, I was uh, with this logic seminar, like, like in a party. But eventually, I wanted to continue to uh, computing. I applied to uh, Israeli universities, American universities, and got a bunch of offers and moved to Michigan and negotiated with uh, some Israeli universities, but eventually re remained in Michigan. So when I came to Michigan, I actually didn't know much about computer science, but I wanted to know. And 
a question in my mind, what is computer science about? You know, if something is called science, it doesn't make it a science. Um, and I came to conclusion that it's really about algorithms because uh, if you think about it, everything is an algorithm. Even operating system is an algorithm. Uh, programming language itself is a kind of universal algorithm. It takes a, a given program, a data, and runs this given program on the given data. And so I worked on, on the problem of what is an algorithm. And that gave rise to abstract state machines, which eventually brought me to Microsoft. And in Microsoft, it, oops, it was indeed, um, so first five years, we, so I had a group on um, software engineering and uh, we worked on a tool based on abstract state machines. It was very hard. Eventually it worked. So we worked on specifications, verification, testing. Testing emerged as hugely un underappreciated, especially in academia, but super important. I came to believe that mathematical verification is just another form of testing. When finally, our uh, window uh, took our tool, adapted our tool. I wanted to, I also realized that I'm not a good seller. As a head of this group, I had to sell this tool, uh, our tool to, and I didn't want to do the selling job anymore. and. In the meantime, I, I struck a good relations with a number of brilliant computer architects. Strictly. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in, and uh, I found it's much more, much more rewarding for me to call, to work with them on whatever they are interested. Because then I don't have to sell anything. And each time it's a kind of new stuff, I don't know anything. Uh, this few architects grew to, to believe that it's worth working with me and they would explain to me um, their problem like to a child. You don't get this to university. If you, if you try to, to enter another area, there are, you know, there's hierarchy there. You, it's, it's not so easy. In the industry, it's different. They have to solve a problem. Anybody who can help is most welcome. And due to, to all this wonderful atmosphere, I, I get to work in various different domains. And eventually, uh, they opened a little group on quantum computing. I actually didn't know any physics, but I started to go to their seminars and eventually co-authored some paper and asked them whether they can actually move to there. And they were sufficiently, maybe too open-minded, they took me. Okay, that's the rest of my story. So you see this background. I didn't, didn't know that Georg will <laughs> sketch it. Okay. Um, so speaking about foundations, I want to start really from very foundational problem and namely inventing an alphabet. That is super impressive. From continuum of sounds to just few sounds. It was a, uh, so, so it was invented by uh, West 
Semitic tribes known as Canaanites. And they, in this Semitic languages, you largely can ignore vowels. So, so it was enough for them to, to deal with consonants, but still there was a lot of consonants. And some people, if you remember biblical story of uh, Shibolet. So there was a, a tribe that couldn't pronounce Shibolet. They would say Sibolet. So it's really a continuum of consonants. So the very idea is astounding. And the result was sort of sacred. And that helped. That helped. You know, otherwise, it probably would be impossible to, to make this alphabet to, to spread it around the world. One interesting thing that it's definitely imperfect. It was imperfect for the original languages, but it's sort of good enough. And this feature of being imperfect and good enough, which maybe not so natural to mathematicians, certainly very natural to engineers and in general in applications, that was not a bug, that was a feature which allowed um, the alphabet to spread. So there are zillion of stories. So if this is the very original alphabet. The current theory is that it's inspired by Egyptian symbols. So Egyptian, the Egyptians used hieroglyphs, but sometimes um, the same hieroglyph meant different things and they had to produce some uh, additional hint how to pronounce it. And for, for this purpose, they essentially had sort of alphabet built in, of course, they never realized that. But somebody of these Semites did realize. Then uh, Phoenicians, took over and spread it all over the world. Uh, the early Phoenician was also by Hebrews. It's essentially the same thing. And, but Phoenicians were seafaring people and everybody else who worked with them saw that they were writing something and that's how this spread. And of course, Greeks as usual played huge role. There was a lot of interesting things. For example, how this gimel which became gamma, how it became this strange C in English language. But that's a separate, a separate lecture. Now let me go to ancient Greece. And these people were much interested in foundational problems. For example, what's knowledge? So there's this beautiful uh, dialogue of Plato called, actually, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it in English. I'll pronounce close to Greek letters, Therai Tetus. By the way, this last letter, it's not Zeta. It's a special form of Sigma final sigma. You know, in those times, what, whatever pergament or whatever they wrote on was very expensive. So you don't put, uh, you, you don't make a space between words. And so it's useful to have final versions of letters. Now in Greek, uh, sigma is so, so often final letter that in, in Hebrew, if we go back, there's a whole bunch of final letters. Every move, every place where, by the way, these letters called in Hebrew new letters or Ashuri, they were uh, borrowed from Hebrews from the very first empire that um, civilization knew, namely Assyrian empire. First, not in the sense that Egyptians were earlier, but Egyptians were not an empire in the sense Assyrian were first empire in the sense like Rome or British, they would take over and make other people Assyrians. 
So in that uh, part, uh, in that discussion, um, Socrates speaks to brilliant young mathematicians, Theaetetus, and asks Theaetetus, what's knowledge? And Theaetetus says, I have no idea. And um, Socrates prods him and works, as he says, he works like a uh, um, midwife. So <laughs> maybe helping uh, Theaetetus to give um, birth to a good uh, definition. And so Theaetetus comes first with some definition which Socrates immediately throws away, then uh, real first better first definition which deserves the, uh, the name was knowledge's perception. And Socrates, and you may think that this is so early that they did discuss things. No, 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 it was very scholarly. So Socrates discusses various philosophers which were there before, what they said, and he criticizes them and, and eventually rejects this definition. And then uh, Theaetetus comes with this definition, true belief. Socrates criticizes it as well. Then this is a third definition. Knowledge is a true belief with an account. It's very close to modern definition, knowledge as a um, true justified belief. But Socrates didn't like it either. He not just didn't like it, he demolishes it. And at the end, he says, okay, let's meet in the morning and discuss. And that's where more or less we are with knowledge, amazingly. Now I see that I'm speaking way too slow. So let me just mention another uh, sort of similar to introduction of uh, alphabet um, introduction. Actually, it was not introduction of uh, symbols because some symbols were used, but very little. So it was a, a kind of a first systematic use of symbols. Um, so the way Vieta used, he used vowels for unknowns and consonants for constants, for, for knowns. Seems like a reasonable idea. Now, my only contribution here, I found, try to find pictures, Newton and Leibniz, where they are not so old. We are accustomed to see very old, uh, famous people. And here, they, certainly Newton, in, probably in his 40s. Modern age, age of logic and foundation started as a big bang. So there are a great many of very smart people. So in my lectures, I spoke ad infinitum about Andrei Kolmogorov and Alan Turing. So today I mentioned two other figures, partially because uh, last well, half a dozen years or so I'm doing quantum theory. So to people who contributed to logic and to quantum theory. Oops. So one of them is Herman Weil. Uh, he was a student of Hilbert and became a cons constructivist, very extreme constructivist. So in his book, The Continuum, he did much of classical calculus in a predicative way, without proof of contradiction, without infinite set. And in the same 1918, he had a bet. This is the first time in my life that I published something of that sort. I was in uh, Zurich uh, visiting in 19, 
probably still 1980s, uh, maybe early 1990s, visiting uh, my friend Erwin Engler. And his neighbor came and they spoke in Swiss Deutsch, which I quite want to understand. And I was looking what he's on, on his table. On his table, there was a piece of paper with a lot of signatures of famous mathematicians. So when Angela was back, I asked him, what is this? And he said, it's a bet that uh, Herman Weil um, had with George Poirier. So Herman Weil was so much convinced that this constructivism will take over the world. So in, in the bed, there are two theories which Herman Weil uh, conjectured that in 20 years will not be viewed as a theory. One was that every bounded set of real numbers, non-empty set of real numbers, has the least bound. Another one, that every infinite set has a countable subset. So that was that in 20 years, if these theorems are not considered by majority of mathematicians or by more influential mathematicians uh, as uh, theorems, then while wins and otherwise polyam wins. So you can guess who won. Uh, later, he converted to Brouwer kind of a, a little less restricted um, form of constructivism. But in the meantime, he was working on mathematics and physics. And by the way, his teacher, uh, Hilbert, was not amused. Hilbert didn't, didn't like any kind of artificial restrictions to uh, mathematical activity. And um, eventually, while Weil's position moved much closer. So here is the, um, in, in this book, Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, um, Weil has an epigraph from T.S. Eliot. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated. And you better have, <laughs> um, don't restrict too much your tools. So he made, he made major contributions to theory of, um, so especially in this book, theory of groups and quantum mechanics into quantum mechanics. For some reason in my work, I kept coming to the things that Weil did and, and, and he wrote beautifully. So another hero, is John von Neumann. Here he is from um, in kind of non-professional film, just a glimpse of young uh, von Neumann. So von Neumann uh, did quite substantial contribution to logic. For example, he didn't like that Zermelov theory was all about sets. He, he considered functions are more um, kind of primitive object. And he had theory of functions and he had a kind of trivialized uh, type theory. Um, uh, object can or cannot be an argument for a function. Eventually, Bernays simplified this, and that became uh, the theory of sets of, uh, and classes. By the way, in, in, in his um, work where he described that, 
what he was criticized by he got a letter from Polish logician Lesniewski, and Lesniewski found an error. Well, not not a very important, not a principal error, but nevertheless an error. And uh, Neumann wasn't somewhat annoyed, but fixed it. And then Lesniewski found a problem with a fixture. And you know, Neumann was kind of genius doing so many things at, all the time. And now this guy, uh, but this guy was right. And so he made another correction, but then Lesniewski died. <laughs> this exchange finished. So, so uh, in, um, I don't think von Neumann ever got Nobel Prize in physics, but he was the one who made quantum theory accessible. He invented uh, the notion of Hilbert space. and presented the whole theory as theory of operators in, in Hilbert space. Uh, I recall reading somewhere a joke that um, Hilbert and Bernays who was his student attended some conference and everybody spoke about Hilbert space, Hilbert space because it immediately became very popular and Hilbert turns to Bernays and asks him, what's the hell is Hilbert space? Okay, recent past. For a while after the Second World War, logic was rather popular and very foundational. So the first computers were designed on logic foundation. Um, symbolic artificial intelligence, which is logic based, has been dominating other AI approaches for a long time. Till about 1980s. Logic programming was quite a fad. Not standard analysis was, uh, you know, technically, logically, maybe it's understandable to, to professional logicians, but what Abraham Robinson did was, was actually hear about the infinitesimals, which always people like Weierstrass and spent a lot of time getting rid of them. And turn, at the end, turns out that yes, they, they do make sense. Forcing revolutionized set theory and made it and solved, which allows set theories to solve um, outstanding problems in mathematics. But then th things started to change. While the need for logic foundation research, I believe, never was greater, in reality, less and less attention is given to foundational issues, even in areas like set theory. Now, I asked Nahim Magidor whether he would agree with this, and he vehemently disagreed. But, so, this, <clears throat> this is a personal opinion. By and large, logic factions are slowly fizzling out at top mathematics and philosophy departments. So one department which I visited uh, many times in 80s uh, and 90s was math department of um, ETH or ETH Zurich. And it has a glorious logic history. It was, start, it was founded by Zermelo, the, the logic group. Then Bernays was there, Specker, and then nobody. And not because logicians didn't want to be there. I actually wrote a couple of times for when another logician would retire. I wrote for 
very deserving people. But apparently the department didn't want to have logicians. There are now many more logicians in computer science than in mathematics, but the work is more technical and foundational. In particular, as I mentioned, the golden age of logic in artificial intelligence is behind us. Uh, now we go to the future. <laughs> On the pessimistic side, foundational logic research fades away. It doesn't mean that particular people still may have uh, brilliant careers. Significant logic areas become parts of mathematics or computer science. But by and large, <coughs> as Elliot said, between potency and existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with but a whimper. So I certainly hope and would like to encourage as much as I can a different future, much more challenging. Nevertheless, better. So more comprehensive logic research. So I think it was a mistake, especially in, in United States, logicians fought hard to prove mathematicians they, that, mathemat that logic is good mathematics. Actually, mathematicians are probably the last people who need help from deduction experts, because mathematicians are de deduction, experts in deduction almost by definition. On the other hand, there are so many areas outside which can use logic research or logic foundational research. I think also the research should be more foundational. Throughout ages, logicians made great contribution to foundations of various sciences, including mathematics, but not only mathematics, especially physics, but also not only physics. So let me, uh, I had this kind of unhappiness, the way foundational research develops for a long time, but I didn't think long what should be done. So what I present here is something which hurriedly was done in a few days after Lev invited Lev and Stanislav invited me to give this talk. I mean, so but here what it is: inductive logic. So already Aristotle mentions inductive logic in addition to deductive logic, but he himself didn't do much progress on that. Later, there was some progress. So Bayesian inference or Bayesian inference is certainly the most substantial in advance. Popper's falsifiability, uh, many people in sciences um, think very highly about um, this falsifiability principle. Uh, it was noticed, not by me, but I don't have a good reference, that actually falsifiability principle, it is falsifiability if you speak about claims which have universal character. So if you want, if the claim says for every x phi of x, let me see. I think I can annotate, can't I? Ah, okay, never mind. Uh, then you cannot prove it because if if there are infinitely many possible uh, values of x, but if you find one value for which phi is false, then you falsify. If your sentence has a form, there exists x phi of x, then you can, can actually prove it, just exhibiting that x. Then you cannot, you cannot uh, verify, you cannot justify the sentence. Now, if the sentence has a more complicated 
um, quantifier structure, like for all x there exists y, then you cannot falsify it and you cannot uh, verify it. Uh, there is something Solomon, uh, called Solomonov induction in inference, uh, much related to Komogorov complexity. Uh, I'll leave it. In any case, one way or another, um, inductive logic remains a challenge. Oops, let me see. I clicked on it. Okay, good. Judicial logic. So, to me, logic is a science of convincing argument. And judicial logic is, of course, the one which <laughs> fits the bill perfectly. So, I'm no expert on judicial logic, so I looked up Wikipedia. They mentioned a lot of um, work done in the area, computational models of argumentation and decision-making, computational model of evidential reasoning, and so on. And then they say a variety of formalisms have been used, including propositional and predicate calculi, deontic, temporal, and non-monotonic logics. I am somewhat skeptical. If you have, it, it's possible that logic, uh, say predicate calculi, which um, was designed to deal with mathematics, will work well for judicial logic, is doubtful. So here are some uh, past le lessons so in late 1980s, um, a colleague of mine at Michigan, a professor of electrical engineering, um, used or invented some many valued logics for the purpose of um, computer architecture. And he asked me whether these many valued logics of his are known or had been had been known, uh, I didn't know. So we discussed the issue for, for a semester. Once a week, uh, we went for lunch and discussed this, and I tried to do some research. I discovered that there's an ocean of many valued literature on many valued logics, and there's no way I can find it. So I did the best I could and took on my conscious <laughs> telling him, that go ahead and publish your paper. <coughs> Most probably, these logics were not known. But what it, um, he told me that for any k between three and thirty something at the time, um, in, fa in fact, it was nineteen eighty eight. Uh, there were for any k between three and thirty something, there was a commercial many valued logics kind of used in, in uh, industry. And I looked in some of those logics. So the idea is this. Uh, you want to design essential logic circuit. But logic gates are expensive. You know, in engineering, it's always a matter of cost. So what they do, they do all kinds of shortcuts, but they have to convince themselves that the final result works as intended. And so they have these logics which strange uh, logic values like weak amperage or medium amperage or high amperage or same bit voltage and various other things. And some of those lo logics were horrible, were not closed under conjunction. And it was obvious that a little the logician can sit down and make those uh, logics much 
prettier, much easier to compute with. But there was no connection. There was two completely disjoint world. The, many, the world of many valued logic done by logicians and many valued logic done by electrical engineers. So another lesson is in logical databases. So um, I remember attending my first computer science conference and Moshe Vardy was speaking in, about using interpolation theory in the theory of databases. And I started to worry whether interpolation theory will work in, if you restrict attention to finite structure. So I asked him whether his databases can be infinite. And he said, yes. But in the world, in the real world, databases are finite. And eventually we understood that logic, that theory of databases needs special logics, which in, in, turns out that in world on finite structures, you know, the, the completeness of first order logic or compactness, all this or interpolation, they are not true. On the other hand, complexity, computational complexity is very relevant. So anyway, and, and again, I, I, don't, I don't know any logician in, who actually works on judicial logic. Let me see, next challenge. Uh, you might know this famous book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. So as a human beings, we have this thinking fast, which is we inherited from our um, animal ancestors. It's something when you feel, you know, you are in a prayers, imagine 10, 20,000 years ago, you are um, working in prayers, try, trying to find some animal to kill or maybe to find fruits to, to eat. And suddenly you, something looks to you like uh, a tiger and you run and you didn't do any good logic analysis. It, it could have been just something yellow, but it makes sense for you to run, taking into account that if you're wrong, <laughs> then the price is very high. So the slow reasoning, the slow thinking is our rational thinking. And that's what we, our standard logics are for. But there's this fast thinking. It, it's very unusual, but it certainly has, surely has logic of its own, worth investigating, I would guess. Coming back to knowledge, today we have so much more data than Plato did, but very limited progress. Even today, we don't know what, um, we don't have a good definition of what knowledge is. We do have more complications because there could be probabilistic knowledge. So you may have a certain probability, probability know something. I doubt Plato thought about that, though who knows. What's information? We have information theory uh, by Claude Shannon, uh, whom I Should I go back to left? You can share your screen again. Or what happens? Uh -huh. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> okay, just try it again. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
oh, now it's much better. Now I see some faces. It was extremely hard to speak without seeing anybody. <laughs> okay. So, but Shannon answered only the question, how much information? But not what information is. So I came, so I worked when at Microsoft, uh, I worked with- uh, Can you enter full screen? I can do full screen. It it will not um, the size will be wrong. I think you can read it as it is now. It's not too small. We can do it. Yes. So what I discovered that nobody knows what privacy is. So everybody discusses privacy. There is no agreement. So different people gave different definitions and very different. So what's privacy? So in the paper of on so-called inverse privacy, uh, I have two co-authors, but I was the one who actually <laughs> wrote, wrote it. So I tried to to give a little, a little bit of foundation. So it, I used the notion in phone introduced earlier, in some security logics, and a tangible in phone. So in phone is a piece of information. A tangible info, an info which actually has some material existence. As a result, there is only finitely many tangible info. Okay, and so on. So, not only it is possible. I don't think it's so not so not so even difficult to do some foundation. Start to do some foundation over these subjects. Just people don't think it, and the people like us, logicians who we are supposed to be the professionals on foundations. Most of us don't look into it. Now, this is completely speculative. It's a good quotation from John von Neumann. I, I like it very much. If people don't believe that mathematics is simple, it's only because they don't realize how complicated life is. So in fact, can logic research be useful in neuroscience and biology? <clears throat> so maybe the first reaction, surely not. I'm listening already for several years to podcasts on neuroscience. And I'm sure there is a place for, foundation, for logic foundational research there. There are also social sciences, which more and more become real sciences. People used to, you know, maybe till now, physicists may laugh at one social sciences, partially because there are no sim there seems to be no simple laws. You don't have, you know, Newton binom in, in there. But can foundation uh, foundation logic research be useful? I'm sure it can. For example, everybody speaks about fake news. Maybe we can analyze. In a sense, every news is a little bit. There is, whenever a person speaks, there is some kind of spin. There is no such thing, no spin or pure factual. So it's all a matter of degrees. And maybe, yes, we have political divisions, but maybe certain things can be bridged by computing things. Okay, I think uh, so my one of my critics whom I showed all that he said, oh, you just want to go back to philosophy. To a sense, yes. When I was a boy, philosophy, I think I think would attract me more if, if I was allowed any exposure to philosophy, but I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. But still there is a difference between what philosophers do, and many of them do wonderful things, um, and what logic foundation research could do. For example, the, I think the most important is incremental improvement 
the virtuous, virtuous circle of incremental improvement that we have in sciences and which rarely happens in, in philosophy because people have different ideas and they discuss them forever. But so Thomas Kuhn tells this story on electricity. So when electricity became popular for a while, any educated person could read anything about electricity because there are several theories. One would explain static electricity well, but couldn't didn't know much about uh, flow. Um, and other could explain different parts of um, flow of electricity, but not static electricity. And any, any book, any paper would start with the basics and therefore every educated person could read it. And then one of the theory uh, championed by uh, Ben Franklin started to gain, not because it was better on all the grounds, but it started to gain ground and it became sort of a consensus to work on it. And then virtual circle of incremental improvements started and in one generation, Electricity, the electricity became a deep science. If you want to learn about electricity, you have to go to, to university and take a course on electricity. Another uh, important aspect is you better have applications in mind. So, for example, Georg Cantor, uh, with his notion of sets, would not succeed if he would continue to, to argue with Kronecker forever. But analysts notice that it's just convenient to, to use sets. And the rest is uh, history. Similarly with, with Kamagorov wrote his axioms of probabilities. There are very strong opinions what probabilities are. And he just provided mathematical foundations without deciding who is right, who is wrong. But he provided foundation on which you could compute and, and, and the, the virtuous circle of incre incremental improvement started. And of course, many theorems, not just opinions, even very clever opinions. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me just say that this wasn't as provocative as I hoped <laughs> it to be. <laughs> However, uh, um, there were several remarks and some questions in the chat, but let me abuse my right and ask the first. Uh, question about what you said. So, <clears throat> so when you say that, uh, so check whether my understanding of what you tried to say is uh, more or less correct. So uh, you are saying roughly this, that the traditional mathematical logicians are sort of, uh, are we are studying uh, let's say mathematical models of certain phenomena like mathematical proof or proof in uh, that were developed uh, a long time ago at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's the call uh, sort of by uh, in view of the law of diminishing returns or something like this. Yes. Uh, to come back to the task, the originators of mathematical logic, uh, like Hilbert and Frege were involved with to develop new mathematical models of certain phenomena that are still there and need to be formalized or treated uh, on a more rigorous basis like Juridical reason and, uh, and other things you mentioned. So, would, be, would that be the correct interpretation? Yes, yes, definitely so. So, for example, in this paper was uh, of uh, inverse logic, mm -hmm. 
inverse uh, privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was um, one of my brilliant uh, computer architecture friends in Microsoft. Um, and he had kind of an idea. And I couldn't understand what he mean by inverse. What do you mean inverse privacy? Mm -hmm. um, now, he was very patient. He would explain to me, we, we met once a week and we worked on all kinds of things. So it's very typical of Microsoft when, you know, he worked for some group and then when, if and where they succeeded or, or even failed, but typically when it succeeded and achieved something, he goes completely different place. And he would ask, come to ask to me, Yuri, will you continue to work with me, say on, uh, some strange things I said <laughs> I would love to but I don't know anything about it and he says I don't know either but I'll learn and I'll, I'll teach you and so that's how we got into this uh, inverse privacy and I started to think what it what is it in, in a sense I, I worked like a midwife uh, um, mode of uh, Socrates trying to squeeze uh, his name is uh, um, Yefim tried to, to squeeze from him uh, what, 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 what did he mean? And eventually things started to become clearer to me. And, but what was needed in this small case, I don't want to overstate here's my, it's a very humble, very small case, but nevertheless, in this case, uh, when we you need to provide certain foundations, what you're talking about. So if it's inverse privacy, what is the other one? The direct privacy. So you have to define things sort of, and when it was done, the whole work was really a kind of foundational, semi-philosophical, but at the end, it was, you know, our purpose was not to prove theorems, but convince Microsoft to, to implement it. So that's where majority of our time comes, came to, to push Microsoft to do it. Uh, so we thought about practical side, but it definitely can be continued, can be theorem, can be proven. So, the, the, so definitely the theory of privacy can be developed in a more kind of scientific way where you can understand what you're talking about. There is, from the very below, there are certain, certain things that people, I think, should agree. I think nobody would argue that there are these pieces of information, that some of them are tangible, that there are only finitely many tangible, what personal, uh, inform, no, not, not exactly what, what cannot be ruled out as, your personal information must be careful with this. <laughs> Privacy, it, it's a very subtle issue, but certain things can be developed. Okay. okay. But you're right. You, your understanding is perfectly correct. Okay. So let me now turn. I will later ask other questions, but uh, <laughs> let me first give. Uh, 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 the word to, to people who wrote in chat because okay. so, um, the first who did it was the reaction by Rohit Parikh to something you said about knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, I can read it but also Rohit may uh, if you wish to, to say uh, what you wanted to, to say so if you if Yuri goes back to in chat to roughly uh to let me see yes to 6 42 p.m if you uh, then you can read what what rohit uh, wrote uh-huh oh 
or I can read it. Or can, can you please? Because it's very small letters. <laughs> okay, I, I will read it. I will read it. Uh, so the first remark was was this. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Plato did not endorse the justified true belief account of knowledge. Uh, true. The, true. <laughs> yes, the Tetus ends with an explicit rejection, rejection by Socrates of the GTB, uh, justified true belief theory of knowledge. Mm -hmm. See Pari Rohit and Adriano Renero, justified true belief, Plato, Gettier, and Turing, philosophical explorations of the legacy of Alan Turing, etc. So uh, I perfectly agree. I think I said that Socrates rejected all, all yeah. three definitions at, at the very end. It's, it's very interesting to end. He says, let's meet tomorrow and continue. <laughs> and essentially, that's what we are doing. <laughs> what was interesting is that uh, already <laughs> Plato rejected it. But still, yes. the people <laughs> did talk about it, <laughs> you know, 2,000 years later. So they, right. <laughs> that can be, yes. That, that's a philosophical question, the typical it's, philosophical question. It is quite amazing. Yeah. Maybe I should tell an anecdote how I came to read this. Uh, I was in Amsterdam giving lectures on finite model theory, and a Russian girl came, Natasha. Um, and she asked me, uh, oh, you write dialogues. You're probably a big fan of uh, Plato. And she looked at my face and said, have you read any of Plato dialogues? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't have any classical education. And next day she brought uh, a copy of uh, Theaetetus, Theaetetus. And I read, and I was so much impressed by now I read all of them. <laughs> it's truly impressive. Very good. I don't like I don't like politics of, of Plato, <laughs> to be sure enough. It's very totalitarian. But it's amazing. Yeah. Very good. Now uh, Andrei Rodin uh, made a remark about the yet maybe you can uh, just comment. Uh, yeah, I just hit small historical issue. No, that's actually, Viet is a goge is, uh, is very, very important. Unfortunately, not that much known, not translated into English, uh, available in Latin. And French people read mostly in Latin. And now in Russian, we can read uh, thanks to Zhenya Zaitsev, who recently completed uh, Russian translation. So it's uh, uh, indeed yeah, it's important. It Yuri, obviously. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, uh, certainly. certainly. <laughs> Thank, but but <laughs> I, I, if I may, I just use, uh, you know, a couple minutes commenting on this general issue of, uh, okay. uh, say, foundations and how philosophy and mathematics works, because it's also kind of personal for me. Uh, I, I don't know if you agree, because you mentioned that, right, there is kind of decline of foundational research, and I wholly agree with you that we need more. So in that sense, we are complete. But I actually uh, charge a part of responsibility on community, and actually both philosophers and probably mathematicians, because I think what, what's really happening that uh, philosophers uh, learn very little, <laughs> say, of uh, Mathematic logic, and when they do, they're trying, how say, to uh, to make philosophical foundation for it. So to be kind of to develop kind of metaphysics on on the base of a given system, and 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 usually they just don't go far. I mean, just uh, first all the classical logic, and then a lot of uh, uh, how say justification for it. And on the other hand, in, in, in mathematics, people often become kind of, they try to be agnostic about, say, philosophical foundations, but it's very well known, um, how say, fact that when you're trying to be agnostic, you become very easily dogmatic uh, instead of being critical. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's indeed, I think, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing, actually, because you need to do philosophy systematically and mathematics. So it's really, really a big challenge, but I absolutely agree. I think you, you really, your example just gives uh, at least um, how say that it is possible <laughs> after all. Yes. I was lucky.
lucky. It was some, I, I was unfairly lucky at certain point, not in the beginning of my career, but when I came, when I wanted to transfer to computer science. So my first priority was Jerusalem and Saharon Shalach went went there to lobby for me and it was completely counterproductive. They decided that mathematicians don't have enough position for logic and they try to put their, their men into, into uh, computer science. But in America, it was differently. Computer science was more engineering and they needed somebody to teach whatever theory was there. So I told very uh, honestly to, to people uh, anywhere where I was interviewed, that I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a logician. I really want to become. I, I work in applications in, back in Russia and I, I want to do something useful. And Michigan hired me on a, he gave me full professorship and tenure on a promise to become a computer scientist. And in fact, I, when I started the very first semester, I went to the chairman and said, I want to teach, uh, I want to give a course on programming. He said, no. I said, why not? He said, we have plenty of people to teach programming. We hired you to teach theory. I told him, you made me to promise you, give my word of honesty that I won't become to computer science. How will I become if I'll stay in theory? Okay, he considered this and said, okay, you can teach, you can teach um, programming once. <laughs> and I taught programming and I realized how, how bad the situation is. For example, you teach, I, I taught Pascal. Nobody knows who Pascal was. There was no, or still, there is, what is legal? Different compilers behave differently, disagree. What's the real thing? What do I, as a mathematician, I was just, I didn't know what to, what I had to teach. It was a real crisis and that, that's actually helped me. And then when I was at Microsoft, when you come to a, a group, uh, especially if you work via a computer architect who trusts you, then you exposed to something they just discovered. Nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows what kind of science is needed to help. So there was, there was a case of something I worked year and a half, and it was obvious sort of you need machine learning. So I went to zillion of, of machine learning uh, presentations and studied machine learning. And then turns out kind of Bayesian analysis helped and when, when things became better understood. And so again, I was lucky to have this opportunity since our group succeeded for a while, I can do what, whatever I wanted. Uh, but eventually this other activity was also not completely unsuccessful. And so I had this opportunity to come and think in my free time, so you, you're right, the system is not well. So, so if you're trying to uh, develop your career, it's very difficult to, to go and start to think about something which is nothing is promised and nobody cares and you don't know what the result. You want to uh, first to kind of make sure that you bring uh, bread and butter to <laughs> your family. So it is true that the society also not well, de well designed to bring these things. But all these startups, all these new industries, that I think is a very fertile ground. I wish if I was a student today, I would go to neuroscience for sure, because that's where things happen now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good. So. Uh... Then I would like to give word to Mamuka Djibladze. Are you here with us? Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, 
Yeah, ask your question. That if you don't have, uh, maybe something. Uh, Yuri, I was just wondering. I mean, do we really yeah. know uh, the, what what's the actual uh, focus of attention for foundations? Because uh, before there was an agreement about the parallel postulate in Euclidean geometry. Probably uh, the, uh, some part of the foundational questions were focused on the Euclidean geometry, and now when there are some open questions in about large cardinals or uh, uh, piano arithmetic or type theory, now somehow it's considered that, okay, Euclidean geometry is now more or less clear, but now foundations are concerned with set theoretic questions. So I wonder if uh, after a while when this large cardinal questions will be clarified, maybe uh, foundations will move to some other topics or how, how it will be, how, what's your opinion? Uh, on set theory, my opinion is not that important after leaving uh, logic seminar in 1961, I, I didn't work on set theory. Uh, but my impression is that set theory, because as Anil told us, it, it was so revolutionary, it attracted so strong people. So it's a very strange phenomenon. It is largely an isolated island in science, but with very strong people. Typically such isolated pieces of science are not so strong. But here there are one of the most strongest people of the, um, in mathematics of the generation working there. And in the beginning, a lot of open problems like continuum hypothesis, uh, uh, like whitehead problem. So, so outstanding open problems were solved. My impression is that by now, less and less, there is an intervening of set theory into famous problems. People, more, people are more open. People understand that certain things may not be provable. For example, P versus NP. It may be not derivable from piano or something, but we, we all open, certainly we are open to this possibility that it may be P, it may be, it may be equality, maybe not equality, maybe it forever will be <laughs> unknown. So that is a new brave world. You know, even for Einstein, it was somewhat difficult to, 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 to accept that um, uh, this you know, bell pair, uh, so influence on distance, which sort of contradicted intuition. So certain things, but we have to think science the, the way it is. So if certain things cannot be decided, that, that's how it is. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot give you something very satisfying. No, no, I could ask the same about P versus NP or anything. I mean, because uh, in uh, geometry, we now know that uh, uh, we, you have Riemannian manifolds with variable curvature and somewhere parallel postulate holds, somewhere it doesn't hold. So. Uh, so could it be that the same happens with things like P versus NP or something like that? With P versus NP, I thought more and can say a little more. I think polynomial time is the next to fall. You know, originally when people spoke about decidable and undecidable, there was certain naivete. I was there from the very beginning of, of this, or not the very beginning, but relatively in the beginning of the subject. And there was some sort of naivete that if you prove something decidable, it's, it's truly really, really real world decidable. And then it turns out that you may have a problem which is decidable, but no good algorithm is known, probably will never will be, like Tarski theory of, of uh, the reals. And then there are theories which are presumably undecidable, like you take Hawking problem. If, uh, if you're really interested in holding problem for 
say for C programs, it's it's uh, it is all, to all practical purposes decidable. Not 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 with hundred percent, but nothing in life is really hundred <laughs> percent. So in reality, if if you have a, a program written in C, not specifically written by a logician to make your life difficult, but a normal program, and you want to know whether it's uh, halting or not. Uh, so there are methods, there are tools developed actually in uh, originally at Microsoft Research uh, Cambridge, England, which were very successful in, in that. Uh, so the world became more complicated. Then we started to, to make fetish of uh, polynomial time. But of course, polynomial time also not necessarily feasible. You know, suppose you prove that certain collection of graphs uh, um, let's see, like you define uh, plain graphs as any graph which which doesn't um, embed these two particular graphs. So this can be generalized and you can have a collection of graphs defined you can prove that it is polynomial time, but never know what polynomial time. Polynomial time itself may be way too expensive. So I, I've mentioned this many times in my lectures. Once I had a discussion with a Cook on some of the conferences, and he, he was saying polynomial time is feasible, feasible is polynomial time. Uh, but in a more subtle way. So if you have a feasible problem, then eventually it turns out to be that it's not just polynomial time, but low polynomial time. And I argued that polynomial time is not necessarily feasible. Feasible is not necessarily polynomial time. So for example, take American um, IRS. They have several, you know, less than what, tens of billions of files. Probably, probably less than 100 billion files. And suppose I want to know something about a particular American. So they can very easily have polynomial time, in fact, linear time algorithm to go through the files and find this person. But then they will do it. It's, it, it's just way too expensive. They will use index and find, find the person in log time. So even linear time may be completely, not completely, in principle feasible, but not feasible in any practical way. So uh, it's, it's a long conversation, but what I want to say that it's, uh, the world is complicated, like T.S. Eliot <laughs> told us. But certain problems <laughs> are attractive to mathematicians just because of their difficulty. So they are like benchmarks that they should reach. And I'm afraid P equals NP is such a problem by now. So right. any arguments against P, uh, good as they can be, uh, uh, will, well, not, will not change. As conservative as it gets. <laughs> yes. yes. OK. Uh, let me give uh, the word to Professor Daniel Isaacson from Oxford, who wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I was fascinated by the case, the sketch you gave of the notion, the development of the notion of inverse privacy uh -huh. and the process you went through with your colleague in coming to what the notion was. And it makes me wonder whether that process bears some relation to what Kreisel called informal rigor. Probably, I, unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, I exchanged letters with Kreisel, but after second letter, I realized that I'm not can maintain, maintain this relationship. Well, I mean, I don't know, but it sounds right. Yes, I mean, he has one paper called Informal Rigor and Completeness Proofs in, well, published in 1967. Um, 
where he gives various examples. It's always by examples. But I mean, for example, the arrival of at the axioms of set theory from uh, Zermelo's 1930 paper of understanding the structure and thereby extracting the principles or going back to his earlier, Zermelo's earlier work. I mean, it's a process of taking something that's worked with and understood and extracting the principles by which you can uh, work with it rigorously, but not work with it formally. As, as far as I understand from your explanation, that's exactly it. It was exactly informal rigor investigation. To make things as rigorous as possible, not without having any axiomatic system to derive anything. <laughs> yes, but it just sounds like it was that might be an instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. Uh, next question from Grigoria Alhovikov. Uh, I can read it in chat, but maybe you can ask it uh, yourself. Grigori. Oh, thank you. So, Professor Gurevich, you were mentioning uh, the logic of fast thinking as when you were describing the perspectives. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you would accept uh, the following preliminary description of, of what is to be done in this uh, direction. So, does the logic of fast thinking boil down to one, having uh, a catalog of fast problems in a given domain? to having a practicable measure of closeness between any two problems in the domain. And three, when you encounter a problem, any problem in the domain, then uh, apply the solution for the closest easy solving problem. So the question would be in two parts. First, shall we, if we try to set up a logic of fast thinking, shall we try to implement something like that? And second, how should we strive to implement it if that is what to be implemented. Uh, so I didn't analyze the problem. It just occurred to me that it's an interesting problem to work upon. Uh, so in, in his book, uh, Kahneman speaks a lot about this mechanism and it's found in, in even primitive animals. You know, that's how they escape, that's how so they survive. So that there's certain things which were found practically. So the closes within, we need what, what topology. So it's related to surviving. You know, there's this famous expression, uh, um, flight or fight or flight. So you have to quickly decide, do you fight or do you fly? What? And, uh, and quickly is the key, the key word. Because if you hesitate, then you don't have any choice. You have to fight. And it maybe was a wrong decision. So, and, uh, I think I should admit I'm not prepared to, to analyze. What you said is not unreasonable, <laughs> it sounds rational, but it's the right thing, probably not. I doubt from the first attempt you, you get it right away. Let, let me tell a real, real story how we found uh, something. Uh, it was access control. And so we worked um, with Itai Neyman, quite a famous set theorist. Uh, for some reason, he was interested. He wrote to me and I was able to invite him. And we worked on, we worked on access control. We looked what goes on there, it was, the whole thing seemed quite ad hoc. And we thought whether there could be any system given. But in the meantime, we also tried to study what is out there, especially the system which was, uh, uh, was a group at Microsoft 
producing crew, which was quite, quite good, but seemed to us ad hoc. We wanted to have some ideas how to improve it. And then we noticed that most typical things that people need in access control are actually very easily decided. So that was just observation. And so we started thinking, what, 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 first of all, what does it mean? So after a while, so first of all, what does it mean? Most nature, most, most obvious things. It, it, it's vague. So what is the language which we can decide quickly? And then we work and eventually prove that we can decide it in n log n. Uh, this log bothered us. Sometimes one shouldn't bother because if log maybe it depends on what you're speaking about. If if log is not not more than three, that why why should we bother? But here log was more could snowball, and eventually we proved that it is. It, it, linear time. So we have this linear time logic. And to say that we prove, we prove, but we use quite sophisticated, difficult advances on, on linear time algorithms. It was very non-trivial. A few weeks ago, I spoke about this in, in this uh, St. Petersburg uh, seminar. In, and then it gave rise to certain logics. And it turns out that it's probably close to really foundational stuff. For example, uh, intuitionistic logic came from analysis of mathematics. You come from this, to the same logic from analysis of much simpler things. It has nothing to do, also may do with mathematics, but doesn't have to. Certainly speaking about whatever, you, you get simpler logic, say linear time. And then if you put some natural condition, it jumps to intuitionistic logic, do you want or not? In fact, there is kind of gap. Well, there's nothing in between. We just jump all the way. So let's see, the lesson what I want to say that if you study something, it's good to, study the subject first. If you just, uh, I'm not criticizing you. So if you get a lecture, something occurred to you, it's reasonable. But if you actually want to work on it, it's needed to study. You, can, you may notice something. You may notice that nothing works. There, there are things, there are open questions, which life is complicated. Okay, I think I said all I have to say. Well, thank you. That was a very long and interesting answer. <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, we're closing to, to the end of our discussion. Nevertheless, I would like to ask my question at the end. Uh, nearly the same as I asked Anil Nirod at the end of his um, lecture. So you mentioned the following. Uh, so you mentioned in your talk that uh, symbolic AI or logic-based AI is dead, more or less. That's uh, uh, well. Maybe I'm. Maybe you said something more polite than that. But but <laughs> the implication was roughly this. Uh, we all know that uh, statistical AI uh, or machine learning is uh, not dead at all and uh, very successful. Uh, do you think that there can be some kind of merge of the two? Or sh we should not marry the dead person with the life person? So let me say, not just to be careful, but for the sake of uh, uh, reality, um, the symbolic approach is not dead. So it, people keep developing and there are certain successes. So for example, I can point to Vladimir Lifshitz at the University of Texas. 
it, it's somewhat different than the use he used to do when McCarthy was alive. McCarthy was his American mentor. Now, currently, let's see, let me say, I published together with Vladimir Volk, one of the last students of Kolmogor, who is now in London. <laughs> we published our first, certainly for me, it was first paper in uh, machine learning, in the machine learning conference. It was really a statistical paper, but st statistics and machine learning are definitely merging. And this merge is very difficult. Statistic is science with long tradition. People have certain ways to do things. And machine learning is a kind of hacking. It works. Nobody knows why. But foundationally, it's amazingly interesting why it works. So if you look, analogy say with human brain, they took the very, very sh shallow analogy. So the human brain is much, much more complicated. There are many structures which come completely absent in current uh, neural nets as, as, as implemented in AI. Nevertheless, those simple things do marvels, especially this, uh, uh, what we call deep AI. And foundationally, I think it's an amazingly attractive story to understand why it works. Now, it's possible it's so difficult that you will become a machine learning expert and never, <laughs> never come back to logic. So it, ideal situation if, 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 if you work with a very strong team, where you help them, but you have certain autonomy to, to think about your things and publish in your, in your area. So I think marriage between the logic approach and current machine learning slash statistic is not impossible, but very removed. So it's not in the near future, not in the <laughs> because they don't, all this careful, the whole thing that they don't do anything careful. They just throw data and it gets wonders. You know, when I was, before I went to Microsoft in Michigan, I attended a linguistics seminar. I loved it. It was very interesting. So when I came to, to Microsoft, I went to linguistics seminar. It was boring. It was all computational linguistic. It was brute force. Uh, but it works. We don't know why. <laughs> Maybe Barbara Party can comment a little bit on this. <laughs> well, no, I would certainly say that in, in linguistics and in cognitive science more generally, even though it's recognized that marriage of symbolic and, and this deep AI kind of thing is, is very far removed and difficult, it, more and more people think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. It, it, within linguistics, symbolic is definitely not dead, but it doesn't do everything. But yes. if, um, uh, that symbolic doesn't do everything is um, <laughs> sort of not surprising, but whether <laughs> statistical methods don't do everything, that's, uh, it's a question, I guess now. Maybe everything can be done with statistical methods. So, some young people certainly think so, but... Um, not everybody thinks so. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, with this, I think we have uh, used our time, um, uh, and I'm about to close this uh, this session. I think it's very nice to have such a extended discussion after talks like this. So thanks for everyone who asked questions, and uh, first and foremost for Yuri for uh, giving this. Very interesting, and uh, I think it wasn't provocative. I think it was inspiring, rather. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good speed to put it. <laughs> okay.
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, tomorrow we will meet at um, 16 uh, uh, o'clock Moscow time uh, for the talk by Barbara Perkins. Thank you very much. Thank you.